All right, everybody, let's, uh, let's go ahead and get this show on the road. It's Friday, we all had a lot of fun last night. How many people here are suffering from very dry air? <laughs> yeah, I think all of our scientists will be happy when we move to uh, more moist climate. It is uh, my pleasure to uh, introduce our first speaker today. So, uh, Garrett and I have never really met in real life, so it's always cool to come to these conferences and get a chance to hang out with folks that you, you meet online. But I've always really respected him because he's done a lot of really good things in the industry. And he's moving now more towards what he's talking about, which is helping teams kind of overcome some of their, their leadership issues. So I, I know he has a lot of really great things to say. Um, he's a native of Denver, so he's not hurting like the rest of us, so he's going to be on the point. Um, <laughs> no pressure. Yeah. But uh, some, some personal stuff, I know he's married, two kids, boy and girl, and he's an avid cyclist. So give it up for Garrett. I think, can you guys hear me? You can hear me coming through there? Okay, cool. All right, thanks, Marcus. Uh, so as Marcus said, I'm Garrett St. John, um, and uh, I do live about 30 minutes from here, so uh, the dry air and the altitude are, are home for me. So um, <clears throat> I am a, a technical uh, leadership advisor, and I'm kind of excited to share what I got here for you today. So um, technical leadership, and managing the process of making great software. What is that actually, what are we talking about here? So I'm gonna do a quick little poll. Who, uh, who out here is like an independent developer, a freelancer, or whatever you wanna call yourself? Do we have, are we all biz people here? I guess it is the biz track, that would make sense. Uh, how many are studio or agency owners? Okay, cool. So uh, if you keep your hands up, how many have at least five team members? At least five. So we got maybe like five or six of you. How about 10? Two, and how about 20? All right, cool. So we cap out at around just under 20. So good news is that regardless, uh, this talks for you. And uh, if you're on the lower end of the employees, then, then you have the advantage of getting started early. So um, I, I believe that it's impossible to reliably deliver high quality software for profit without a strong technical leadership. And so I've been at this whole development uh, thing for a while. Uh, the first site that I built for, mon for money was in the year 2000 uh, at a little furniture store up in Longmont about, a, uh, about half an hour from here. So I'll go ahead and show you guys that, that, that little gem right there. That's when, uh, as a developer, I thought I could design also. So these, you know, these uh, yeah, maybe not the image, but I think the text is responsive, yeah. You kind of got that for free, didn't you? So, uh, you know, while, while I'm sure you're all enjoying it, I wanted to just point out the incredible user experience there with the uh, products and more products in square brackets. <laughs> really high class there. And then, of course, we can't go without mentioning Prodigy and the state-of-the-art uh, email system. Who out there used Prodigy? Yes, all right, now we're dating ourselves. <laughs> All right, so, um, and it seems like, you know, it's sort of the uh, Expression Engine merit badge to, to show, uh, you know, I was on 1.6.4 was the first time I, I jumped over to, uh, to Expression Engine and, and launched that. This is actually stone production, so don't, don't uh, throw stones. But, um, yeah, so over the 20 years in the industry, I've been a victim of, uh, I've caused, and most recently I've helped people uh, solve technical leadership problems. So why does all this matter? Um, and without a, a strong technical leadership uh, within your, your company, you're going to experience lost profits, higher levels of stress, inconsistency in offerings, and uh, most painfully, uh, higher levels of employee turnover. So we're going to address all these things today. So uh, I'm going to start with a question here. Uh, tabs or spaces? Anybody? Tabs. All right. So I appreciate I appreciate all your input, but as the tech leader, I've decided uh, authoritatively that is that a word uh, that there's a mandatory space only coding philosophy. Uh, so that's how that's how we do tech leadership, right? We just kind of go and say this is what it is, and we we, we authoritatively 
uh, proclaim how things are going to be. And uh, unfortunately, that's, that's not even sort of where, where we start on this thing. So uh, I'm going to share from a report uh, from Project Management Institute uh, in 2016. For every $1 billion that was invested into our industry, into products, there's $122 million of waste due to poor management. And I, when I saw that, I was like, whew. I can't even really wrap my head around that kind of number. I mean, I don't think any of us are making a billion dollars at our agencies, but what if we like kind of translated that and said, let's, let's talk about, <coughs> excuse me, let's talk about two million. You know, I mean, I'm sure that there's some of you that are doing two million, $244,000 wasted. So still, wow, right? That gives you a lot of breathing room. Maybe it lets you hire another team member, maybe take a nice bonus home at the end of the year. This is like a real number. So. And when I put this slide together, we'll see if you can see this. I don't know if it'll come through, but from the same report, uh, the 53% uh, right here, yeah, in orange, I don't know if you can see it, but 53% <clears throat> of projects are completed within their original budget. This is industry-wide. And only 49% are completed on time. Also kind of shocking to me that it's basically half. Um, so with that information, it's not overly surprising, also in the report here, is that 45% of projects experience scope creep. So not too surprising. What do we take away from here, um, and how do we make sure that you're not a victim of the, the statistic here? And my, my proposal for that is establishing limitations. Um, un Undermanaged teams over-deliver on the work that they do for their clients. And it may not be every project, and if your pipeline's full, you might not even realize that it's happening. Things may be, you know, feel good, everybody's getting paid, and, uh, but eventually it's going to catch up with you, and especially as you scale up uh, with employees, it's going to become more glaring. So what does establishing limitations looks like, look like? Client says, hey, can you just add me to Slack real quick? I need to talk to the developer. I want to I catch up and just let him know what it is. No, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> we were thinking we should build this in that like new view framework, you know, that new JavaScript framework, the hot, sexy new thing. Sorry, no, not going to happen. Uh, it should take just like four hours. We're going to refactor that spaghetti code into the class, and we'll just, we'll just. Sorry, no. But too blunt. Yes, I'm, I'm, I'm making a point here. Just saying flat out no is obviously uh, is obviously too much. You don't have to be a dictator. You just have to be a leader. And so what I suggest is to start with no and let yourself be swayed by your team and, and, and solid business decisions instead of the cool new thing or just general, um, you know, the site needs to be built in this kind of stuff coming from a client. You know, we heard about some of that stuff yesterday. So sometimes setting limitations means saying no to your ownership or to project managers, sales, you know, the, it's not just saying no uh, to your team or to your client. And so that's, that's the, tech, the, the tech leader's job, which is to protect the team. That's one of the biggest things that you can do as a, as a tech leader over developers is protecting your team. So if uh, only roughly half of all projects are coming in on time and within budget, what do we do as tech leaders to solve this? Uh, and that's managing the budget and the schedule. Now, I don't know how many of you came from a developer role, but if the tech lead's not taking the charge on this, then the estimation's going to usually fall down. It's going to trickle down to the development team. Um, devs tend to be eternal optimists. I know I was one of them. I, uh, and, and so, you know, we say, like I said before, no, it'll just be like four hours, you know, half day I'll have it to you, and it just doesn't, it just doesn't happen that way. Um, so when you talk to these developers, you've got coding, which I love, and then you've got estimating a complex task on a project that we're not really on yet, and I wasn't a part of discovery, and it's under spec so, hmm, I mean, I think you can kind of see where this is like, I'm just going to throw out a number. I, last time I did this, it was like that. Like, it's, there's just not enough information there. Um, so. This is where it breaks down, and so as a tech leader, you need to be the, um, the go-between sales and development. 
And it's, it's, it, you need to go in, absorb all of the information, the outcomes that the, uh, the client's looking for, um, understand where things are today and where the client wants them to be tomorrow. And then it's quite likely uh, that you'll be able to go in and reliably estimate these things um, and, and gauge the effort to get from A to B. And if you can't make that assessment, my recommendation would be to distill that down as far as you can to the most simple, you know, maybe what would be comparable in Agile to like a card, something that's very simple that can be, that removes con the need for context and, and go to your senior developer um, and say, okay, I've done all this, but what does this look like? Like, I've never done this. I don't have any context on, or any uh, experience in this. Tell me, tell me what it's gonna take. And I think you're gonna find that you get a lot better responses that way because you're making it bite-sized. So as a team leader, keep projects profitable by establishing limitations. Personally take responsibility for managing the budget and the schedule. Clients, owners, and team members alike, they're all gonna thank you. So <clears throat> projects headed to better profitability, right? We've done things, we've established limitation, we've managing the budget. Let's go eight hours for this, 20 hours for that. Now we just fire up the Gantt chart and we just start delegating, right? We're just gonna fire this all off. Not so much, unfortunately, right? So let's start with basics. These are humans. They happen to be my, my humans. <laughs> this is a robot. Most of you probably like this robot. Uh, so there's a difference, right? Well, except for this one. This is a human dressed as a robot. But that's, that's a different thing. Each person on your team is unique. And unfortunately, we just can't push a button and expect that the final product's gonna come out of, out of the end of the machine here, right? So with that loyalty to companies, and I, I see if you all agree, I mean, loyalty to companies is rather low in this industry. Um, you know, if you've experienced what I have, most employees aren't making it past five years. You know, some of them not two, some of them not even one, you know? The cool new startup, uh, in San Francisco's calling me like I'm headed out there or uh, the, you know the guy down the road has better projects whatever those things might be we see a um, turnover in this industry and so turnover is expensive and and so job descriptions and interviews and HR setup and you need a computer and you need software and here's access to github and here's you know on and on and on it actually typically takes six months before a team member is fully up to capacity where they're producing at the same, le the, uh, the same as the rest of the team. And so, you know, from a business mindset, that's hugely expensive. So how do we prevent this, this turnover? And, and my response to that is, is that humans want purpose. They want to feel valued. Um, they want to feel like they belong as a part of the team and that they're on a growth path for career advancement. So um, companies that get great work don't necessarily retain employees. So, so how do we do that? And my answer to that is culture. Um, you know, Marcus talked about Bluefish yesterday and the culture that they have there of, of helping their local community. I mean, how's that not something that you can get behind if you, if, if you believe those same things? Um, so culture is the personality of your organization. And much like your own personal personality, it's it's the sum of all of your actions, the way that you uh, make choices, your routines, the way you interact with others. And so collectively, these things are what make your company culture. But why do we care? I mean, I know we talked about the fact that it can help us retain employees, but why do we care? So looking back at personality, we have a worldview, and that worldview is the lens through which we look at things. It's the context for how we perceive um, the world. And so in, throughout life, you know, you meet other people um, and they're all looking at things through their lens. And, uh, and so typically we find that our friends are the people that have a similar lens to us. You know, we don't kind of butt heads as much or we, we say, yeah, I agree with you. Like, let's, you know, and you, and you go off on a tangent talking about that. You know, friends, spouses, family, a lot of the times that this is a similar lens that everybody's uh, looking for. And you kind of want the same thing for your agency in a way. Um, 
your culture should attract individuals in that share a similar lens to you, and it should deter away the people that don't share that same lens. So let's like look at an example, and it may be kind of a, a crazy one, but I think it exists. So if you have a culture of at any cost, right? So we'll, we'll get it done, it doesn't matter, I will have it shipped to you on this day, it's gonna happen. So the tech lead comes in, they say, hey everybody, you know, we've been working real hard, but we're just not gonna make it, I'm gonna need you to come in on the weekend, right? Come in on the weekend. Gotta have the office space reference, right? So typically, you know, most of us are kind of bummed out about that, but, but if your culture is one of, we get it done at any cost, and you've brought in employees, that believe in that, cult in that culture, great, now I have plans this weekend. I had nothing to do, so I'm coming into work, right? Not necessarily a bad thing because you're not violating the culture of the company. You've established that, you've brought in people that believe that same thing. And on some level, we see companies like Facebook and Google doing this. You know, there's perks, right? We'll wash your clothes, there's catered lunches, you know, there's a, there's a cot that you can like crash for the night. Like these things is like, it's trying to create this culture of we work with the people that we, this, you know, our family in a way. And so, you know, if you value lazy Saturday mornings with your family and watching football on Sunday, like, you know, you're gonna end up a little bit like Milton. <laughs> so, you know, poor Milton. <laughs> you, if you recall, Milton actually set the office on fire, so, I wouldn't wish that on, on any of you. And, and realistically, if this is the culture that you have, hopefully you were at Kevin's talk yesterday where, where he talked about burnout, because that's gonna be a real thing very soon. But how do we, how do we set this culture of, um, of uh, or how do we set the culture that we decide? And so the first thing I always recommend is a really large budget allocation for motivational posters. It's, it's a proven thing that these things really do it. Nothing like $200 in posters says, I really mean this. Um, but after you've done that, like, you know, just get that done. And then the next thing you're gonna do is, um, is keep in mind that actions speak louder than words. So it's very easy to throw up a poster that says something, but that's not something that we live by. And so how can you say the right words? How can you... Uh, how can you think about culture the right way without having taken a step back and thought about uh, what your company stands for? And so a typical story that I see is oftentimes many of us started out solo. You know, we were a developer, a designer, things got busy, the pipeline was full, how am I gonna solve this problem? Uh, and the solution is, well, I'll just hire somebody. And um, so who do you hire? I've never hired anybody. I don't know who I can trust. And, and oftentimes that ends up being a past work coworker from another company or a college buddy or dorm mate or maybe even somebody in your family. Uh, and I would say tread lightly on that one, but, but the, you, know, you, trust, you trust these people. And so congratulations, you have a culture. And the culture is your relationship. Because again, you're looking through a similar lens. You've probably picked that somebody because you can trust them uh, because you're looking through a, same, a similar lens. And this does scale for a while, but it's unspoken and it's unconsidered, and it begins to look like the uh, also mandatory Venn diagram. This one's my favorite here. I don't know if you can see it. How well can we see it? Yeah. Obviously not uh, applicable, but I've, I was told we need to have a Venn diagram. Um, but I think what we can take from this is with five employees, there's some overlap in that pancake area. Um, and then there's a lot of uh, individual personality outside, you know, in the yellow, the white, and the blue. And as you hit 10 and 20 employees, that pancake area is gonna get smaller and smaller. Those, those circles start overlapping less and less. So, you know, what's the ideal? Is it that we're just a circle, we're not a Venn diagram? And I'll remind you, we're not drones. We don't act the same. Humans are not robots. It's easy sometimes as a business person to think of it as a system that we can just like move stuff through the system. And unique perspective is actually incredibly valuable within a team because it strengthens 
uh, it strengthens the viewpoint. It allows for back and forth. Um, so while you do want to have those things, alignment is important. I think that's the word I'd pick is alignment. Um, so where do we start with that? And, and it starts with you as the owner, as the tech leader, as the senior developer, whatever you call that role at your company, it starts with you. And um, it starts with what you believe about the world, how you work, the relationships you have in your family. I'm sorry, the relationships in your life that you have. And so if it doesn't start with you, there's no possible way that you can be reinforcing it every day. There's opportunities to make choices probably hundreds of times, I'd say, in a day. And if you have a culture that's the poster board motivational culture and you don't believe it, you just put the posters up, how can you possibly consistently act out that same, uh, that same culture? Um, so the next thing I'd say is, is be different. Um, and not just be different for the sake of being different, but you know, we're, we're told as business people that we need to position our company within a vertical so that we become the experts and everybody comes to us for whatever that, that position is. And on some level, it's the same thing uh, for, for our employees. Um, you want to have a unique culture. So again, that it draws in the people that can clearly understand and see, I fit there. That's the, the, those are my people. Um, and, and hopefully you don't even get the people applying that say like, I don't know, I don't know what they're doing over there, but that's not for me. So start with you, be different, and last, share and demonstrate. So you're going to want to share and demonstrate this culture daily. Part of that is writing it down. It's very easy to have these lofty uh, sort of unformed ideas in your head of what you want culture to be. But if you write it down, it's going to, it's going to help. It's going to solidify it. And then once you've done that, you want to use your culture as a filter through which you screen decisions, interviewees, even potential clients. Because if it doesn't make it through the filter, it's not meant to be a part of your, of your system. And you want to encourage employees to do the same thing. So if employees understand the culture, they're going to help reinforce it because they want it just as much as you do. They want to keep the cool vibe that you have and the, the trust and the respect that you have in your company. And they're going to help Seth like perpetuate that, which means if you have an issue with micromanaging, all of a sudden it's like, well, I don't know what to do. Maybe I should ask Garrett. Well, no, I, I know what the culture is. I know what he'd say. I'm running it through the filter, screening it through our culture to see what the answer would be. And so you end up not having to be as hands-on with these things. So don't over-deliver. Over Build a unique culture that attracts the right employees. Um, and so if all this is overwhelming, great, you're like every other tech leader, this is a ton of work, um, but it's important work. So how do we get started on, on these things? And uh, I've got some advice. Yeah, I had to use an animation, plus I wanted to show you slowly, I thought if I put process up there you might just jet. Kind of, kind of uh, intimidating and boring sometimes, but I promise this will be interesting. So uh, I want to start by saying I never recommend process for process sake. A lot of times that's why I think people get burnt out on the idea of like, it's just, we just, you know, office space again, your TPS report, right? It's just like, I don't understand why we need that, but the boss said I needed it, so. Um, processes are only valuable um, if they can standardize an aspect of your business. So you want it to help your team work better, make your client and agency relationship smoother, and allow your company to make more money. These are the reasons to have a, uh, to have a process. Um, so uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna warn you in advance, this is a, a camera moment, um, if you wanna take a picture, because I'm not gonna read through all these, but these are just a list of like four places that I've found um, to be valuable uh, points for adding process. I don't know if you can catch that, Susan. I might be standing in front of you. Um, so, so where do we start with this? And, and, the one, and, and what I want to start with is new client onboarding. We'll just use that example because I think it's probably one of the first places that you can have the biggest impact on, on, uh, on your company. So think about the story of a new client. It's probably a little bit different from everybody. But ideally... Ideally, you have a client. They've wrote you a nice big check. If it's six figures, you're doing, you're doing great. Everybody's happy. 
filled the bank up, you know, pipeline, everybody's going to get paid. All these things kind of on, on, on the service side feel really great. And on, and on the client side, you know, they're, they've given you this, this, this money and they're hoping that you can provide on what you offered to them in the time that you said you can do it. But what next? When are we going to talk next? How do I review things? Where are we tracking progress? Where do I provide feedback? Questions and questions and questions. And um, if you're like me, these questions are fairly consistent and regular. Um, so how many times have you responded to the email or, or, or handled the freak out from the client being like, I don't, I don't know, I, like, when am I going to see things? Like, what, how do we do this? And so what I, su I suggest is to step back um, and think about those frequently asked questions and, and answer them, write them down, compile them into something that can be a deliverable to your client. And, uh, and so now every email, I'm sorry, every new client that we sign on, they, we just send them the email. We're, we're going to preemptively answer their concerns and, and their questions. And uh, they don't haven't even realized some of them yet. You're going you're gonna to jump ahead of the curve. And so here's the big deal, you know, I mean, yeah, great, we, we wrote an email. I mean, I think this is really important. But the big deal is, is that process earns you the option to improve efficiency through automation. And so that's what I'm going to talk about next. So sales, right? Sales team, I don't know, some of you may have sales people, sales teams, maybe your sales also. But... But sales closes a contract, right? The proposal's accepted, we get the money in. What do we do next? The last step of the process, and yes, sales has process too, is to enter the client into, uh, into our invoicing system. Just wanna say this is not a paid endorsement. Uh, Tom's here, I've never seen him mad, so today's not that day. We're gonna go, we're gonna go with Harpoon. I suggest you check it out as an awesome invoicing system. Now, great. Sales comes in, they say, great, we need to send out that invoice, put, the, put them into the system, and now we're done, right? Well, we've got this thing, and I'm sure everybody's heard of, I will say it's Zapier, I've heard it's Zapier, don't know what it is, I'm going with Zapier, but uh, what if we have that hooked up to, to Harpoon, and it triggers a web hook, you know, and, and fires off, off, us off to, to link it? Kevin Smith is here. Never met, seen him mad, so I'm not going to frustrate him today. We're going with Lean Kit for project management. So the webhook, you know, the webhook fires off. We create a new client in the system. We invite all the team members to that. We maybe even invite the client. All these things can be massaged however you want, but I didn't touch it. Sales put it in. It just happened. Well, what if we keep going? Drip. I don't know if you're familiar with the Drip. It's like Campaign Monitor, Mailchimp. Um, so what if that also triggers an email campaign, right? And it's something, that this email that we said before, you know? You fire off a thank you email. You didn't write it. It was already, it was in the drip campaign. Thanks for being a customer. You know, we really appreciate it and we, we promise we're going to do great work for you. And then over the next week, you say, hey, I'm going to email you every day. I'm going to tell you a little bit about what it's like to work with us, how our development process works. And this is who we are, this is our culture, it's a great way to share. And how much effort did it take? None, it just happened. This thing just fired off automatically because somebody put them into the invoicing system. How about a little bit further? Fire off an email to your office manager, it notifies them, hey, that book that we really like about how we do Agile, just go order it off of Amazon and ship it to them. It's a nice little client gift. How much effort did it take? Next to none. As far as I know, you, maybe you can automate that. Maybe, maybe Amazon has an API, but you know, you're, you're removing, you're building a process so that you can automate as much as possible and remove your hands from a lot of it. You know, we heard about that a little bit uh, yesterday if you were in the talk about uh, client feedback. You know, it's just continuing on that trend. Um, so, you know, this is just an example, but automate the mundane. Walk your client through your development process and provide a nice little gift. Harry Styles thinks it's a good idea. So can you see the potential here? I mean, there's, there's a lot of work that goes into this up front to fine-tune to fine how you want your clients to experience working with you. 
And the, the convenience is, is that it's a set, it's, it can be a set it and forget it. You know, it's not, we're not rewriting that email every time. We're not constantly reinventing the wheel. So let's, I'll, I'll flip back to this, this, oppor, this list of opportunities. You know, like I said, I think this is, what is that, eight there? The eight kind of areas that I see a huge opportunity to save yourself uh, effort and automate around, uh, you know, a process that you establish. So this sounds nice, but does it scale, right? If we're doing a lot of client work, if we're doing a lot, if we have a lot of employees, does it scale? Uh, I think McDonald's would say yes. So you don't become the second largest fast food chain in, in, the, in the world without process. And um, that process is going to be implemented repeatedly every time. And the example I would use is this, this is in their kitchen. I don't know if you're going to be able to see Yeah, you'll be able to see it. This is how you, this is how you make a sweet chili chicken McWrap. Never had one, but you know the uh, the burger engineer is not thinking. I'm going to go bacon cheese patty today. I'm going to really I'm gonna really mix them up here. The McDonald's has defined this. It tastes. It changes their taste profile. They want it to be this way, and it's consistent and it helps their team work effectively because it's removing. It's it's a process. It's removing variation. Um, now, obviously, the work we do in this industry is not as simple as burger flipping, but I think the concept translates. This is just a very graphical, straightforward version of that. So use process to deliver consistently while maintaining organizational efficiency. So uh, I unpacked a lot here. Probably the three most to uh, important topics, I feel, um, that, you can, that you can kind of attack as a tech, a tech lead. Um, but I'll drop some teasers on you um, about other ways that great tech lead, um, what, a, what a great tech lead looks like. And so these are all things that you could take back on Monday. So business over tech, this is a hard one, especially if you were a lone developer that found a team. You're not a developer anymore. You shouldn't be in code. You're not solving code problems. And if you're the only one senior enough to solve those code problems, you have a hiring issue. Take yourself out of, out of code because the team's going to run itself without you. And it may not be the outcome that you want. Number one priority as a tech leader is helping to run a profitable business or running your profitable business, if that's the case for you. Communicate effectively. So as a tech lead, you need to be, able to, you need to be a communicator. And you need to be able to talk to devs and then translate to business. Take business, translate it back to devs. That's your job as a tech leader. Tech leads need to be able to hire and motivate and retain talent by giving them freedom, responsibility, and a path to career development. You're going to have turnover if you don't do these things. Ability to keep calm. So you're a buffer between your, your client, your, well, really the whole outside world, and your team. So if servers are down or Stripe payments are go, aren't going through, Clients blowing their top, you're the buffer between the outside world and your team because they're going to work best if they aren't feeling the panic and the chaos outside of what, of what their job is. Protective instincts. I've said this a couple times, but you're, you're, you are your team's protector. So you can't allow clients, management, and other st staff to, to distract your team with their problems. Again, they're going to do their best work if they're focused on um, their, their work. Proactive communicator kind of goes back to communicating effectively, but it's our job as tech leads to force conversation early and often with our team. And uh, you know, many developers are introverts; they'd much rather sit on the keyboard and, and, and work. And that's great; that's that's kind of what we want them to do. But if we don't talk, there's going to be stuff that comes up. There's going to be unspokens, and so. You want to, let's see, you want, to, you want everyone to understand what you're saying and that when you say it, you mean it. Be a very clear communicator and be proactive in the way that you do it. Sales skills, right? Sales skills, I, I thought I was in tech. I thought I was in manage, like leading. Well, actually, your job as a tech lead is to sell the client on the business reasons for the development work that you and your team are saying that you need to do. 
So, you know, you, 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 I made this so convoluted, I'm going to just read it. So the team's coming to you and saying, without implementing the REST API on the new AWS EC2 server, you won't get the local network speeds that you need when accessing the RDS database. Like all these, like, you know, abbreviations and like tech jargon and all that nastiness. And so as a tech leader, take that in, process it, and, and we turn it into something like, we'll need to invest more effort into breaking that functionality out into a different system so that it can scale as you grow. Sounds great to a business person, right? That's what they care about. They want to know, is this going to last for five years, 10 years? Uh, when I have that big hit, like, are we going to be able to support it? So we're translating tech jargon and tech talk into things that help sales. Humility. So just because you're the tech lead doesn't mean that you need to know everything. You may have been a senior developer at some point, but again, you're letting that go. Um, you don't have to be the best developer on the team. The best leaders are humble enough to know when they don't know, they know what they don't know. And they can listen to their team, gather all the information, and then act on that information. And the last one is empathy. So I said it before, and I'll say it again, humans are not robots. And so it's our job as tech leads to stand in their shoes and, and look at their work from their eyes. Try to understand uh, what they're experiencing. So they say to never throw new information at the conclusion of a speech, but uh, I, I just had to do that today. Um, and I'm only able to like very roughly touch on those things, but there, there, is, uh, there is something about that. Um, I have an email course that talks about the three topics that I talked about today. Um, uh, establishing uh, limitations, culture, and process. And so I talk about those things in a little bit more detail. Um, and I also regularly write about all these topics on my email list. Um, so if those things are interesting to you and there'd be some, some value into that, um, my, uh, my URL is up here, agencymistakes.com. You can sign up for the email course on there. And uh, thanks for the time and attention. And I have, is it nine minutes? Math, time math, also another dev problem. So is there any questions I could answer for anybody? Or is it 8.45 after a great party last night? <laughs> cool. Well, thanks, guys. Appreciate it.